Hello, School Transportation Nation. Tony Corpin here. We're so happy you made it. Uh, it's podcast is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Got a great lineup for you today. Mr. Ryan Gray is here with me. Ryan, welcome. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Excellent. Glad you're here, Ryan. Uh, we'll be talking uh, with Taylor Hannon just a bit. She's interviewing our guest, Sherry Darrow. She's a school bus driver trainer from Wapato School District in Washington. So excited for that conversation. Also, guys, reminder to register for the TSD Conference Early Bird Special. Save $100 off that registration for main conference the agenda is out as well uh, you can go check it out at tsdconference.com for all the good information there around transporting students with special needs we'd love to have you come to uh, frisco texas november 8th through the 13th also we are days away from our new september issue hitting the streets super excited for that the editorial team has been working hard to get you guys some really great content so keep an eye on the website uh, stnonline.com on uh, september 1st it will be out but if you can't wait maybe we could uh twist mr ryan gray's arm to give us a little uh, little preview ryan anything you can share about the upcoming september issue around uh technology. Yeah, I'll give a little bit of a tickle here. The cover, uh, we're going to have the team from Dayton Public Schools in Ohio Ooh. combining forces. So as you mentioned, Tony, technology is the real big focus of September and combining forces, bringing together all this technology, this internet of things, if you will, which encompasses all the online, all the data um, that you can imagine, GPS, student tracking, tablets, routing, fleet management, inventory controls, you name it, we've got it. Uh, So we have the the big cover story there uh, on that Internet of Things and how all of these tools are coming together to make things more efficient and safe. Um, And, you know, we're in this huge driver and technician shortage right now, obviously historic proportions and how technology is making the job uh, more enjoyable to do easier. You know, how tablets are, are helping drivers if they get lost to have one of the logistics specialists uh, from Dayton uh, who actually was a driver the past five years. Tell me about how the tablets helped her, if she got turned around on a route, a lot of times, you know, in the dark, we're, we're still a couple months away from from daylight savings time. But that's right around the corner when uh, buses are going to start rolling in the pre-dawn hours. It can be tough to see house numbers on the, on the side of streets or on mailboxes. Uh, so really how technology is just helping get the job of transporting students to and from home done safer and more efficiently. Uh, So also looking at combining technology and training with uh, the issue of student dragging, trying to keep those kids safe in the danger zone. It doesn't happen a lot, but it, you know, one time is too many. Looking back at a 2015 report done by the People Transportation Safety Institute, Kathleen Furneaux, who was at that time executive director, she recently retired, as well as Peter Lawrence, who recently retired as the director of transportation for Fairport Central School District in upstate New York. Uh, looking at that element of students who are getting their their limbs or their their jackets or, or backpacks stuck in the loading door and the driver doesn't see them and pulls away from the stop. Obviously, extremely dangerous, can be fatal. Uh, how technology, again, and, and training are coming together to try to solve that. Looking at the combining of V to G and V to X. So V to G, vehicle to grid, a lot of conversation about that recently, you know, regarding electrifying school buses. We had a lot of discussions about that in Reno. And then the vehicle to everything, where it's, you know, kind of more the smart cities approach, but certainly there's that electric grid aspect. But how buses are talking with other vehicles on the road, how they're talking with, you know, road infrastructure, just a a lot of how all this technology is coming together and what it means to school bus transportation. 
Yeah, I mean, speaking of technology, I uh, took a sneak peek at your column and you touched on how technology lessons learned from Chowchilla kind of was a big news story that we've seen. And uh, obviously, for for those that have been in the industry a long time, there was a school bus hijacking that, you know, made a lot of news and uh, it, it was a big deal. And that person went to jail and, you know, here we are, they're getting released from jail. And, you know, I've seen some social media posts of people thinking, you know, how could it be? Why isn't this person staying in jail forever? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, but yeah, that's yeah. how it goes, I guess. And uh, these are uh, these are things that bring bring up very um, kind of difficult moments in school transportation when you when you have something like that that happened. I mean, gosh, that was back, what, 1976, Ryan? Is that right? 1976. So, yeah, I write in my column. I was I had just turned two years old, so I was uh, just kind of scuttling around the house. I certainly don't remember this incident. Uh, and I, interestingly enough, I, I, I asked Bill Paul, uh, our founder and, and er- editor emeritus, because he had not, he was still four years shy of joining the school bus industry, but he was a journalist at the time and he recalled it, but he, he, he didn't really remember too many details from it. Of course, learned later because it became such a seminal moment in school transportation history. So we actually had three hijackers, Frederick Woods, who you referred to, Tony, he was just uh, paroled um, from prison, and the brothers James and Richard Schoenfeld, who are his accomplices, and they actually had been released a couple years ago. They abducted a school bus on the way home from school. Ed Ray, who we've written about, uh, was the school bus driver, really, you know, looked at as a hero from that incident. But, you know, long story short, he had made a couple of drops already and came upon a van that looked like it was broken down on the side of the road, stopped the bus. Two men came out. They had a gun. They demanded that they board. um, And they essentially took this bus. Um, They actually ditched the bus, moved the 26 kids and and Ed Ray, the school bus driver, into two vans and drove them about 100 miles north to a quarry um, in Livermore, California. So we're talking the San Joaquin Valley here. They, they, in where Chowchilla is, drove north to east of San Francisco to this quarry. And they had an underground delivery van, basically, that was turned into a bunker, if you will. Had some mattresses, some kind of portable toilets, bread, water. The whole um, idea was they were going to keep these kids and, and the driver in this bunker while they made a ransom demand. And these are three, you know, kids from an affluent families in the San Francisco area. They basically it was a get rich scheme. But what they weren't thinking about was the wherewithal of the drivers and some of the older children to get out of the bus. They actually dug their way out, flagged down a worker at the nearby quarry. And this is like 18 hours after it happened. So in the meantime, the entire state, actually the whole nation was riveted. They didn't know where these kids were. They found the bus. The law law enforcement did. So these uh, three um, criminals were caught. They were put in prison. They were actually convicted and put in prison for life. But that was actually reduced a couple decades ago to uh, life with the possibility of parole. So I write about that in the article. But, you know, looking at from a technology standpoint, something that was unfathomable back then, still kind of unfathomable today, but we look at where technology has come. And, you know, we we know that there's about 300,000 or so school buses out there that have GPS, that have this automatic vehicle location, along with other information, a lot of all this, all this other vehicle and, and driver data and student data that they can they can gather. But, you know, back then in 1976, we certainly didn't have any GPS on any school buses. We, we didn't know where these school buses were. I mean, think of cell phones too, though, right? I mean, every kid in, oh, yeah. has a cell phone these days with location services because, you know, we got helicopter parents. Exactly. And, and so this how things have changed. And I'm, I'm looking specifically at the GPS aspect in my column, but where, you know, something like what happened in Chowchilla shouldn't happen today. Now, granted, if there's 300,000 buses with GPS 
to your point, Tony, there's what, you know, 150, 200,000 buses without. But like you said, the school bus drivers, they all have cell phones now, although they shouldn't be using them while they're driving the bus. But all the kids behind them have cell phones. So certainly a different landscape, um, but very interesting to see kind of the juxtaposition and, and where we were and where school buses w- were and where they are now. Really kind of drives home the point that in a lot of respects, the school buses, they look the same like they did. 30, 40 years ago, but inside and all the data and all the technology, how vastly different they are. Well, and I think, you know, when when I started looking to write my column as well, the topic of obviously School Bus Safety Week, which isn't too far off, and School Startup, which everybody's kind of in the thick of. And, you know, it really dawned on me, like, what is transportation look like on day one, right? Like, I talked to a few transportation directors, a friend of ours, uh, Feely Bonilla down at Hayes ISD in, in the Austin area. It was his birthday. I gave him a call, wish him happy birthday. They asked him how the first day of school went. He's like, yeah, there were some bumps. You know, technology wasn't talking. You know, we had a lot of phone calls, but, you know, we're, we're already in it a week or two and it's a lot better. So day one was a little bumpy. And, but, you know, two weeks later, they're in great shape and things are running how it should be. So I think you go through this kind of getting the dust off, getting back into the, the rigmarole of everything with transporting kids. The kids are getting back on. They're very excited for school to start back up. Well, some kids are. My kids are. They're young. So uh, they're excited to get back to school. But um, at the end of the day, parents, you know, you have to train them up. You got to make sure and remind them about school bus safety, getting on the school bus. What are the kind of rules around the bus? What should you do not do? Um, And, you know, we've seen fatalities in that loading and unloading zone. And I know uh, we have a story up on stnonline.com, which cites a lot of different studies that specifically identify parents' concern about the safety of their children going to and from school, especially with passenger cars and around buses, there is a genuine concern for kids' safety. And this is, again, where training and technology can really help mitigate some of that. And, you know, we always talk about it and I'm sure you guys know it. School bus is safest vehicle on the road. Doesn't mean that we're zero fatalities though. As an industry, we like to set that as our goal, zero fatalities. But at the end of the day, that is very hard to be 100% and everyone to be 100% all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to work really diligently as an industry and at a very granular level to educate everybody. And, you know, we can't point the finger like so-and-so is going to do it because then no one does it, right? At the same time, transportation can't be held accountable for 100%. The driver can't be held. Everyone has to take their part. And uh, we have to remember that engaging the parents, doing our best to kind of remind them because they have a vested interest in keeping their kids safe at the end of the day, right? As a parent, I do. I feel that with young children, it's my responsibility to, to teach them life lessons. And if that's safety around the school bus, then so be it. But as a parent, you get so wrapped up in your life that sometimes you forget that. So getting a little nudge from the school is very helpful to kind of rebubble that to the top. So make sure guys, if you haven't reached out to your parents or you you haven't talked to your administration about that, make sure and make a concerted effort to, you know, communicate with your parents on what your kids should be doing around the school bus in terms of safety. And, you know, you can also share what you're doing from an investment of technology, but you know, technology isn't an end all be all for, for the situation because, you know, passenger cars are driving by illegal passing, You know, we always talk about NASDIPs and they have the uh, one day study, uh, which they have not done in a while. I think it's in the works, Ryan. We're still waiting for the results on that one, right? Yeah, they they, uh, it paused with COVID. Apparently, states were were doing that this past spring. So we should be getting that news. I I actually saw NASDIPs uh, last week. They released their agenda for uh, their back to in-person meeting in the Washington, D.C. area in uh, late October, which our Taylor Hannon will be in attendance. But they will be uh, releasing the data from that uh, 2022 study. So kind of updating that. I think the last one was done in 2019 before the pandemic. But yeah, to your point, Tony, I think, think you know, technology is a tool, right? But the tools um, in our tool belt are only as good as the training. 
How are we trained to use them and how do they work with the other training that we get? We always hear training is paramount. You know, we can't just take the the technology at face value. We have to apply it. Um, and you know, you mentioned the school bus. It's actually it's got the safest record in the in the school commute time of any other vehicle. So it's not the safest vehicle per se because this is a very big. It's a it's a tank, right? And if it's not, people are not trained to use it properly. We know that the school bus can be you know a, a very dangerous vehicle in itself. This is this huge big you know, build on a big truck chassis. So, you know, it, again, it comes down to the training. It comes down to the danger zone, the loading and unloading procedures, how students are conducting themselves on the bus, how the drivers are operating the vehicle. And then certainly, you know, a lot of that's out of control is what's happening around. So you mentioned the other motorists passing buses. There's a lot of technology now in terms of video cameras or predictive stop arms that are designed to use artificial intelligence to to try to at least give you know a warning. But again, these are warnings. These are more passive systems. Where it really becomes active is the training element and the and the people behind it. We can have all the technology you want, but if you don't have that people power, that brain power at work, then you know you can have all the technology in the world and it's not gonna amount to much of a difference. So yes, yeah, certainly there's that training that that school districts are doing each and every day with their staff and the training that we as parents need to do and that school districts are trying to to influence with parents and the community. You see all the time out throughout the school year, PSAs and videos that are being put on YouTube about safe school busing and, you know, safe school bus stops and don't pass the, the buses when they're stopped with the stop arm out and the red lights. Yeah, the PSAs, right? You see the exactly. PSAs, AAA just did a PSA, right? Reminding motorists, be aware around, around school buses when the lights are on, right? Mm-hmm. Don't pass. So it's just constantly that repetition from everybody in the value chain. I totally agree, Ryan. And, and I think, you know, as, as school startup rolls and you guys get rolling, don't forget to keep an eye on your routing and our friends at TransFinder want to help. They have one of the best products in the market. It's called Trifecta. That's RouteFinder Plus, the browser-based solution, Wayfinder, TransFinder's innovative driver app, and StopFinder, the industry-leading parent app. And their product plus is now two years old and it has proprietary artificial intelligent optimization baked into it as well as form finder chat finder it's just a lot of finders contact trans finder to get all the information on their award-winning trifecta product you can email them at get plus at transfinder.com or give them a call at 800-373-3609 all right taylor is coming up Really great interview with Sherry Darrow. Taylor, take it away. Hey guys, it's Taylor. I am back. This is my official return. New last name, so I got married. It's Taylor Ekbatani. So if you see that in the emails now, don't be concerned. It's still me. I am still the same person, but I am back and I am so excited to be back. It was a great two weeks. We did our honeymoon, traveled around Europe, but we are we are back, back in the business now. And I have a great guest with me here on the podcast. I have Sherry Darrow. She is a school bus driver trainer with Wapato School District in Washington. So hello, Sherry. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm Sherry Darrow. I've um, been with Wapato for seven years, even though I've been a driver for 18 years and a driver trainer for about 10 years, I think, around there. Wow. So you said 18 total years in the industry, which is awesome. Yep. And I I actually love it. So, And you also have another role as well. Yeah, I'm a board member for Topnish Washington. And um, this is my first term. It's been a tough year or tough. Oh, really? Couple years, yeah. Yeah. So, so what's what's kind of the difference serving as a you know board member versus a driver trainer? You know, what are some big things that stood out to you as, oh, wow, I didn't realize this? You know, you need to listen to the community as a board member and all your decisions are to take care of those kids, get what they need. I mean, that's kind of in both, but I mean, 
you know, you get to make those decisions of what, you know, you feel the kids need, what the community wants their kids, you know, to get, do, become, you know, and um, you work with the administration office a lot. Whereas a driver trainer or bus driver, you work with the community of the kids on your bus. You work with your supervisor and those people at transportation. And that's about it. You know, you don't get the overall picture of the school district, only what you are involved in. That's interesting. So what kind of made you want to become a board member? Well, when I was working for Topnish, everybody complained Mm. about the administration. Oh, this, oh, that, oh, this. And when somebody would retire or leave, I go, well, now that you're leaving the school district, why don't you run for board? So that way you can, you know, maybe make those changes. So you don't have a reason to complain because you're there helping make those those decisions. And um, then when I went ahead and left Topnish as a driver, somebody asked me, are you going to run for school board? <laughs> and, I'm like, uh. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I am. The first time I ran, I didn't make it. It was a very close run. And then um, the second time I ran, I made it. Okay. Because you can't be a board member at the school district you're currently employed with. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. And like I said, it's been a tough year. (laughs) Well, I'm sure with everything going on, I mean, driver shortage is probably a huge conversation at those board meetings. Not at the board meetings. Um, Topnish is lucky that they have pretty much uh, enough drivers to drive. But if somebody's gone, then we don't have the backup drivers, the sub drivers. Okay. So kind of some background, uh, our producer Claudia actually met you at ST at Expo Reno, and that's kind of how you've been introduced into our podcast world here. Um, was that your first time attending? Um, what were your kind of thoughts on Reno? It was quite interesting. I enjoyed that the classes that they had while we were there, our transportation supervisor, assistant and mechanic was there. Okay. And I found out that they decided that the school district is going to purchase four, I think four new electric buses and try them out. Oh, wow. Yep. So, I mean, it was good to go. And I got to talk to, you know, different people about the things that are, are out or coming because as a bus driver, even actually on the board, if I was to not go to some of these things, I would never know what's out there and available. Mm Mm-hmm. So let's jump into that a little bit. You know, as a driver trainer, these new electric buses, you know, what do you need to be prepared for now in the training of new applicants or of new drivers on on these electric buses? Have you done any a deep dive into that? I haven't, but I did get the opportunity to um, ride one of them and they seem to handle just like the regular bus, just that they're quiet. Mm hmm. You know, you don't, I don't know, because I wasn't driving. I don't know if you'd be able to hear your bus start or, you don't know, <laughs> is it, is it running? <laughs> and um, because it was so quiet. Right. But like I said, I wasn't driving. So I, you know, I don't know everything about behind the wheel. Mm-hmm. It just seemed to handle the same way as a regular bus. Okay. The only difference would be is that the noise of the bus. Mm-hmm. I know I drove one at the ACT Expo in Long Beach here, and um, the regenerative braking is really what got me, like taking Mm -hmm. your foot off the brake and then having the vehicle slow itself down. I think that will be a learning curve probably for drivers. I know that really like threw me off. Some of the um, regular buses, I think, are advancing a lot in helping the driver Mm -hmm. so that that way if they're distracted by a student, that the bus will do some of the things that a driver would need to do. Like if there's a vehicle out in front of them, the bus senses it and it will slow the bus down. Okay. So they're becoming so easy. They're so easy to drive. (laughs) Well, it's all that technology, all that technology helping it out. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing you need to remember on that is like where you, you, your turning is different. Mm -hmm. And so you need to watch for that because you are longer and otherwise it's, like driving a car. Wow. Well, you make it sound so easy. (laughs) (laughs) It is. It is. So do you know when you're going to get those electric buses? We just had a meeting earlier this week, and all we know is they're on order. Okay. Because of, you know, a lot of the supply and demand, you you just don't know. Right. It could be 
yeah, I, I totally get it. Um, I'm sure all the timelines are off, but that's exciting. How many total buses do you guys have in your fleet? I really don't know because we've overgrown the bus garage itself. So we have some at one of the other buildings and they've had some of them at the maintenance shop, you know, sitting and waiting. Mm-hmm. So, And I, I want to say, I think there's about 14 routes for Topnish. Okay. And there is closer to 20 at uh, Wapato. Okay. And Wapato is the one that's getting the electric. Topnish is getting the electric. Okay. Wapato, I just talked to the supervisor on Wednesday about the electric buses, and he said they will never come because they need at least four hours to charge, and not all the buses would have four hours to charge. We put a lot of miles on the – I put a lot of miles. I put around 120 miles a day. And I only have like an hour and a half in the morning, hour and a half in the afternoon before I have to go back out. Oh, wow. So um, if they had a hybrid, you know, that might be a possibility. Mm -hmm. And I think Wapato is the largest school district in the state area wise. Correct. Okay. So that kind of, you know, gives a little bit more flavor into, you know, the charging and why you do so many miles. Yes. Okay. Kind of spread out everywhere. And I'm one of those that drive from one end of the district clear to the other end of the district. Gotcha. So long routes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. How, how long is your route? Just out of curiosity. Well, I'm contracted for seven hours a day. And in the morning, I do like two and a quarter, one and a half, but I'm usually over. And then I do about two and three quarters in the afternoon. Wow. Okay. So jumping on the driver trainer side a little bit, you know, the new entry level driver training requirements came out. How has that been going? Have you implemented that? You know, we're still doing basically what the state requires, you know. The program that we do is when we have somebody that wants to become a driver, first thing they have to do is go down and get their permit, which is basically they pay and take the written test. Once they take the written test, then they can come to us and then we can start with their their book work and they watch videos on how to do things or, you know, in different scenarios, what they could do. And then they go out for their drive. They learn how to handle the bus, what their turn radiuses are, how to use their mirrors, how to, to back up. And in training, it takes about two weeks. If somebody's really on it and has, you know, all the time in the world, which I don't because I drive, (laughs) then it could be shorter, but an average of two weeks in most of the districts now actually do paid training. So you're being paid the whole time that you're training to become one. Then you go through and go to uh, get your background checked, your fingerprints done. You get your first aid, get your DOT physical. And um, when it comes to even taking the exam, our district pays for it. And some of the other things that they have to pay out of pocket, you just save your receipts. And once you become a bus driver, then they will reimburse all of that to you. Oh, that's nice. So, but some other districts don't. Like when I became a bus driver, I had to pay out of pocket for everything. And when I was all done, I never got any of that back. But because of the driver, the shortage, you know, they're trying their hardest to make it financially economical for them to come in and drive for us. So my boss used to say it costs about twenty five hundred dollars to train somebody from start to finish. I mean, to them to become a driver. Wow. So that's definitely, you know, investing in the people. Mm hmm. Yeah, we did a couple and then all of a sudden they just bailed and went to another Ugh. school district. So that's why they like now they just save their receipts and you have to drive for so long and then you'll get your money back. Okay. So are you guys at Wapato in a driver shortage? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They've made it so that when you become a maintenance worker, then you also have to become a bus driver to um, be a sub. The mechanics have to go out and drive. They just kind of snag whoever they even encourage like paras they're not full-time always full-time employees and they encourage them to come in and um, also become drivers and or even sometimes we need them to ride the bus when there's kids that are drivers are having problems with different kids because they have different emotional problems but they're not they don't have an IEP to go on a sped bus and we can't 
we can't get anybody. Mm. Yeah, it's it's short. It's a very short list. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that puts a lot of stress on your mechanics or, you know, even you being a driver trainer and also a driver like that puts a lot of added responsibility onto your job. Yeah. Well, say if something happened to the bus, we get a flat tire, we break down. If the mechanics are out on the road, there we sit. And we sit with all those kids. And sometimes, you know, the, we're still loaded sometimes. And wow. so we have to sit there and wait until they're off the bus. Right. And that poses a huge safety issue. Yeah. And especially like if you have nowhere to pull off the road. Mm-hmm. Some of the roads are, you know, our back roads and you're fine wherever you're at. You're fine. But some of the roads, they're, you know, 55 miles an hour, no shoulders. Mm-hmm. What has parent feedback been on that? I can't imagine parents take that very lightly. When there's a situation, then the school will send out robocalls and let the parents know that there's, you know, buses broke down, the students delayed. Mm -hmm. And so, and they understand. Most of all of them understand. Right. Wow. So how many mechanics do you guys total have? We have two. Okay. We just hired one. The other one, we've been without one all last year. We only had one. Wow. And he's driving most of the time. So, And then even most of our drivers are retired drivers that have come back. Okay. Yeah, probably, I don't know, about uh, 60% of them are retired. Okay. Have you done anything specifically, you know, to target or to advertise to new applicants, to new school bus drivers? We've, for years, we've had a big banner that's on the bus garage, you know, looking for drivers. They've now, the newsletter that goes out to all the parents and the families in the district, they've put little ads in there. They send out a bus to attract kindergartners, the parents for kindergartners, and the kids get to get come on the bus and check it out to see what it's like. And the first year that I did it, I took applications and information and talked to the parents. And I'm like, once your student is in school, why don't you become a bus driver? You'll have the same times off as they have and so on and so forth. And then I've worked for a district where they had like a community barbecue before the school started. And we would put out information for, you know, wanting bus drivers, paras and, and stuff like that. And I think like when they have open houses, I think they should have a table set up at the entrance. They could take pictures of the different bus drivers and stuff like that. And so they can kind of, hey, mom, because I've had kids, mom, that's my bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to try to encourage them to because you never know. They, some people are just like, it costs too much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the school district, hey, you get paid while you're training. You know, it helps them out and they can become. Mm -hmm. The educating. Yeah. Yeah. Get all the information to them of what they need. Because sometimes some of them can't pass the fingerprints. So, because most of those things are like a DUI. Right. You know, and everybody go, well, I wasn't drinking. It was because of my medication. Well, it still falls under the same thing. Right. And and you probably don't want those people being school bus drivers. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So for this school year, how's everything going? When do you guys start or did you start? We start on the 6th. We're one of the latest that start school. Okay. And we get out mid-June in the summertime. So are you in the process now of doing your routes? We start checking our routes on Wednesday. Okay. And we'll go out, clean our buses. We kind of just got to dust them off because they get dirty sitting throughout the summer. And then we have the opportunity to go out and travel our routes because we're going to be picking up new, you know, different students sometimes because those that were uh, preschoolers or you know, not in school. We'll have new kindergartners, people that move into the district. And so we'll be able to kind of map out where these people are and get an idea. Me, I just keep driving until I see somebody out there. Okay, there's somebody. Stop. <laughs> and you said that, you said earlier when we were talking that your secretary um, actually does the routing and you guys aren't using any technology? Well, she does the routing. There's technology that's been put in place a long time ago. So she goes through and we'll put that information in. And then we go out and when we're doing our routes, the GPS, she follows the GPS and goes through and she, cause they have us actually stop at the houses. 
mm-hmm. when possible, when we can find them. Because sometimes we, until that student is standing out there, we don't have an address because they might not be marked. So she kind of will follow the GPS on and to do the routing that way. And then we also now have some tablets that are in our bus that helps us where we're supposed to be going. And if there's any changes, then we make them, you know, but they follow the buses. Okay. How long have you guys had the tablets? Well, we got them last year. It was kind of a, you know, practice, see what we can do. They had a training and during a winter day, and then they're like, well, just kind of mess with it. And they're pretty easy because I didn't have the training. I started going through and finding different things and, you know, been using it that way. But like I said, some of our guys are retired and they've never worked with the computers. I mean, we got a driver that's, what is it? I think he's like 85 now. He's got 27 years in the school after he's already retired from the city. Wow. And they're just, they're having, sometimes some are having a hard time, mm-hmm. but they've made it simple that all we have to do is just get it started. And then the kids are supposed to use their um, badges to scan in. Oh, okay. And if they don't um, have their badge, then they can just tap their picture. Okay. So it's, they've made it so simple to use. Mm-hmm. So simple. And these do have our routes on there. And they also even have like, you can do your pre-trip on there. They're making it easy, real easy. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, we definitely uh, talked about the evolving of technology. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Sherry, I appreciate you jumping on. I appreciate you going to Reno and also being a guest on the podcast. It was great chatting with you. Thank you. Nice chatting with you and meeting you. All right. Special thanks to Sherry and Taylor. Great conversation. Enjoyed my chat with Mr. Ryan Gray as well. Guys, don't forget September issue coming out a couple of days, stnonline.com. Go check it out. Also special thanks to our friends at Transfinder for sponsoring this episode of the School Transportation Nation podcast. Don't forget stnonline.com for all the industry news, events, everything coming up. Remember to share the podcast, guys, social media, get it out with the community. We love feedback as well. Send us an email. We want to hear from you. Uh, You can email us at info at stnmedia.com. And you can also spread the word about the podcast at stnpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to pods, guys. We love you, nation. Have a safe start to school, and we'll be there for you every step of the way. Have a good one. Enjoy your day. 